She was just playing on the piano. Somebody bigger than you and I. Sweet Shirley. And I wanted y'all to be able to hear the words. I hope you can. Who made the mountain? First Peter, if you would, First Peter, chapter one. We certainly want to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being with us today. What an honor it is to be your preacher. And of course, we'll need a little extra prayer today. Uh, it's uh, we got a lot of emotional things going on right now, but uh, the Lord will help us, and we know that uh, we have a good message for His people. We want to welcome you to the uh, services here at Messiah Baptist Church where we can say the doors are never closed except for the weather. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but for 37 years next Sunday, we will have steadily proclaimed the truth of God's word. Amen. We have steadily proclaimed the truth of God's word. I can say without any hesitation at all that what we bring to you is not fake news. Amen. Thank you, it is the good news. 
What we bring to you is not a political message. What we give to you is not a fable or a story. But it is a message of truth from God's holy word. And I believe it was Jesus who made this statement in John chapter 8, verse 22. He said, the truth shall set you free. I appreciate those people who will be joining us later by way of YouTube. I thank the Lord that we got that going. Do you know that as of right now, there's 154 subscribers to our YouTube channel. 154 subscribers to our YouTube channel. And I'm sure there are others who do not subscribe who do tune in and watch. I appreciate all your prayers. Uh, appreciate your prayers. Appreciate your prayers for my daughter Jody, and I, as and also Jason's children, Lila, and uh, uh, Ella. Uh, I appreciate your prayers for all the family this week. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the prayers and your financial support for all of these years that we've been preaching teaching the gospel here at Messiah Baptist Church. God has greatly blessed us over these many years. Next week, we will be celebrating our 37th year anniversary. That's a long time to be in any one place. I don't know how anybody puts up with the same preacher for that long a time. But I appreciate uh, your tolerance and your kindness towards me. Uh, and uh, certainly that we began, that, uh, began this ministry. Uh, there was uh, several of us, but in my family, Jason, Jody, Teresa, and myself. And so anyway, we continue to do the ministry. I've learned this, that... The work of the Lord is greater than any one man. And I pray that if and when my time comes, that God will raise up somebody who will say, this is a worthy work Amen. and uh, do the work uh, of the ministry right here at Messiah Baptist Church. Who knows, it may be somebody who grows up here. And uh, I always taught and believed they ought to come from the nursery to the pulpit, <laughs> raised up in church, learning about the Lord. And so who knows uh, but what God may call someone out of our own group someday. Next Sunday is Western Sunday, Roundup Day, Anniversary Day. And I want to ad admonish you to ride your horses, uh, bring, bring your chariots, and your uh, wagons, hook the wagons up, hook the horses up to the wagons, and come on. Uh, we want to encourage you to be here. We're going to have a wonderful meal. Now, I know people are not too excited about coming to hear me preach, but they might be excited about knowing they're going to have brisket, and ham, and potato salad, and rolls, and baked beans, and on and on and on. We're going to have a wonderful time. We're going to have some wonderful music. Hope that you'll be, uh, you know, bring some folks with you. Roundup day. People who have not been here to church for some time, and we've got quite a few like that. So round them up. And if you have a friend, invite your friend. And some of you guys that don't have much money, invite your girl out to dinner. Okay? <laughs> then I'll take you to lunch, hon. Just come go to church with me. <laughs> well, a couple of thoughts and I'll get into the message. It took a lot of faith. It took a lot of faith to start this church 37 years ago. We had the money in our pocket and that's about all we had. Uh, shirt on our back and money, a little money in our pocket. And we worked hard. Uh, there was no financial 
uh, backing of uh, some larger group, some larger church. We simply started, and uh, it took a lot of faith to start that church, start this church. But I've noticed that it even takes more faith to keep it going. Because when we started, we didn't have 30 plus missionaries that we support every month. Uh, we take care of those missionaries. All those letters you see, every letter you see receives a check from Messiah Baptist Church. Amen. And uh, we have never in all the years that we have taken care of those missionaries, we have never failed to give them their monthly support. Now that, my friend, is a testimony. It's a testimony of your faith. And uh, we're trying to be a good steward of uh, th the things that God provides for us. So you keep on being faithful and we'll keep on being faithful doing the work that God has called and led us to do. It takes a lot, took a lot of faith to start it. It takes, a, I said, it takes a lot more faith to maintain the church and its ministries. It is, you know, people drive by this church and they'll go over here and they'll say, oh, that's a nice little church. But we have a worldwide ministry. We got missionaries all over the world up there that we are supporting. And we have our YouTube ministry that goes everywhere. And so we're reaching uh, uh, as much as possible the world as the Bible instructed us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're doing our best to do so. Um, we are a church that proclaims the truth, and the truth being the Word of God. Um, and I like to say it like this also. Uh, we are in a race. We are in a race. Now, I look back there in the back and I see Jojo sitting back there. And Jojo, about 25 years ago, I challenged Jojo and Jason to a race. And they beat me. <laughs> maybe 30 years ago, I don't know, but it was quite a number of years ago. And uh, maybe 40 years ago, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, they beat me, ran a quarter mile. I said, I can outrun you guys in the quarter mile backwards. So then the other day, Jojo and I were talking, and he said, Mr. King, you think we can have that race again? <laughs> but... We are in a race. We are in a race. Um, and we are not just starters. We're going to finish the race. Because anyone can start. But we're going to finish. We're admonished. We are admonished in that race to lay aside every weight that slows us down and every sin that may beset us. We're admonished to run that race that way. Don't let the weight of the world burden you down, throw up your hands and give up. And for heaven's sakes, don't let sin get involved and uh, get you sidetracked. So we are to run the race with patience, laying aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and I in you, you shall be my disciples. He also said, now listen to this, he was talking to the multitudes, and he said to the multitudes who were excited about uh, Jesus and the possibility of him uh, being, you know, uh, taking him and making him king, and all that, and they were excited about all that. And uh, they were following the Lord, but then... One day in one of his messages, Jesus speaking to the multitude said these words. Take up your cross and follow me. And when he said that, Cedric, the crowd dispersed and began to leave him. Because there's a difference between wearing a cross I want to speak to you today on the subject of security. Security. God has loved you. God is now loving you. 
and God will forever love you. First Peter chapter one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, that is, he made us alive, he, we have been awakened, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. My friend, because Jesus lives, we shall also live. Amen. <clears throat> Look at this. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, Amen. ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye, re ye greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, trials of your faith, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, I haven't seen Jesus personally. I've seen perhaps manifestations of his work, but I haven't seen him. And Peter says, whom, having not seen, you love him. You, you haven't seen Jesus, but do you love him? Amen. Do you love him? In whom though now you see him not, Yet believing, you haven't seen him, but do you believe in him? I haven't seen him, but I believe in him. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. These Christian believers that Peter is writing to were experiencing unbelievable persecution. They had been driven from their homes. They were living in fear for their very lives. They were living in caves. They were living in forests and in the wilderness. And so Peter writes them a letter to encourage them. Now, I'm going to give you a statistic here in a second, but I want you to understand, I look, took time to look it up yesterday to make sure I was giving the right statistic to you. Concerning the persecution of God's people, many Christians throughout the world, even today, live in fear for their life and their jobs. I read, not... I read yesterday that in the world last year there were 90,000 Christians who were martyred for their faith. I also read this, that Christians are the most martyred people of faith in the world. 90,000 of them lost their lives last year for their faith. But the Bible teaches that God's grace is sufficient even in these trying times. God's grace is sufficient even in these trying times. Not only, and I gave you this one time a long time ago, but that's all right. Not only are we saved by grace, but we also are kept by that same grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, For if in this life only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For by grace are we saved. By his grace, 
First, by His grace we are saved, or we were saved. By grace we are being saved. Even now God is saving us. And one day we shall ultimately be saved and taken to heaven. Many years ago, many years ago, we had a Sunday school teacher named Brother Bob. Anybody remember Brother Bob? Brother Bob. Brother Bob taught Sunday school for 22 years. Brother Bob. Brother Bob, man, he was a good guy. He was a closet alcoholic. I didn't know it, of course. He, was, he hit it good, Shirley. That's what uh, Judy told me. And uh, one night he got picked up for DUI. <laughs> and he's, his wife called Brother Paul and she's upset. Can you go see Bob? He's down at the jail. Will you go visit him? I went down there and he was sleeping it off. He didn't care if I was there. <laughs> But anyway, I remember he taught one Sunday that he had a, he went to seminary. Brother Bob went to seminary. He was a missionary over to England and Europe for quite a few years. But anyway, he taught Sunday school here at the church for 22 years. But he taught, he told us one time a story about one of his professors said that there are some people who think that they are saved by Greece. Saved by Greece. They slide in one day and they're out the next. <laughs> Many well-meaning good Christian people, and I say well-meaning good Christian people. Oh, by the way, Bob's problem with alcohol didn't make me or any of our church members love him any less. We loved him. In fact, he well, pretty much came back and was sober for a couple of years and we began to let him teach Sunday school again. That's what you're supposed to do, isn't it? You're not supposed to hold something silly like that. I'm glad you all don't know my secret sins. <laughs> Many well-meaning good Christian people have failed to realize that salvation is the free gift of God. For you did not choose him. You didn't wake up one morning and say, I think I'll choose Jesus. It didn't work that way. You were probably running away, trying to get away, trying to escape. And Jesus came and found you. He's the good shepherd. He didn't give up until he found you. And he may still be looking for you. But he's the good shepherd. He'll come. He'll find you. And he'll put you on his shoulders and he'll bring you home. For we did not choose him. He chose us. Many years ago, many years ago, approximately 40 years ago. Is that many years? <laughs> many years ago, I pastored a church, not much different than this church. I pastored a church way out in the country, up on a hillside. It's called the First Baptist Church of West Portsmouth, Ohio. You can look it up for yourself. But West, but Ohio, uh, the Ohio River Valley, which is where we were, is the poorest, financially poorest section of the United States, the Appalachia Mountain Range area. And that's where we pastored, right there in the country. And I had a wonderful, wonderful ministry there. Really enjoyed being there. Those people were very poor. Unemployment. Uh, during the time that I was there was around 35 to 40 percent. Unemployment was 35 to 40 percent. The rest of the people lived on what is called ADC, Social Security, or some kind of disability. ADC is Aid for Dependent Children. And so they lived that way, and only about maybe 30 percent of them had real jobs. So that area was depressed, to say the least. They were, uh, but you know, wonderful people, and I loved them very much, and they loved their preacher. One of the most important doctrines that I could teach them was a doctrine of eternal security. Uh, people who visited the church, people who would say, want to talk about joining the church, they wanted to make sure that I believed in what is called the security of the believer. Most of them, did not have very much of this world's goods. 
So they wanted to make sure that they had a home in heaven, a place reserved, a mansion. I know a lot of people do a lot of different semantics on the mansion and all this, that, and the other, but I'm just going to say mansion, okay? A place reserved, a mansion with their name on the front door. Their hopes, their dreams were laid up in heaven. And Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt, and where thieves cannot break through nor steal. I remember probably 20 or so years ago, Miss King and I were talking. We were talking about the church and the different things and the work here to, uh, in the ministry. And I said to her, I said, Teresa, you know you and I got more money up in heaven than we got down here. We had invested everything to make sure of the welfare of this ministry. And not only this ministry, but in the churches that we were in before. But we've laid up more treasures in heaven. And, I, and I, one time I was talking to a lawyer, and I told that lawyer, I said, I got more money in heaven laid up. And he said, you don't really think that, do you? I said, I sure do. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How else can we do it? than giving to the Lord's work, sometimes even making sacrifices to make sure the Lord's work continues on. Those folks in that little town, there along the Ohio River, they wanted to make sure their name was written in the will. Their name written in the will. It's pretty important to have your name in the will, isn't it? Especially if there's a little money involved. Well, our father is very rich, and uh, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as they say, and the wealth in every mine. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere, somewhere beyond the blue. Thank you, Maddie Bell. Every now and then, through the years. And through the years, let me say this, it's been my privilege to lead people to Christ. People who wanted to be saved. It's our job to show them, to tell them, to help them. And through the years, it's been my privilege to do that, I think, on many occasions. But every now and then, excuse me, every now and then, someone would say, Brother Paul, I don't know if I get saved. I don't know if I can live up to it. I don't know if I can live up to it. They're standards, you know, and I don't know if I can live up to those Christian standards. And what I would say is just join the crowd because none of us do. They're afraid of being a failure to give their heart to the Lord, to serve the Lord, to live for God. But I'll tell you like this, I'd rather try and fail than not try at all. Amen. And while I think people say those kinds of things, I think it's a noble thought. Because I, I, you know, I want to do right, I'm trying to do right, but I don't think I can. But it's a wrong thought. It's a thought of ignorance. Ignorance doesn't mean dumb, it just means you don't know. Because Satan will do everything he can to keep you from putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, not in man. Amen. Jesus came not to condemn, but that the world through him might be saved. I know it doesn't look it, but 56 years ago I myself was saved. I did not know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing when I got saved. I just said, I, I, I feel like I need to be saved because I heard somebody preaching. 
And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I didn't know what I was doing. In fact, after I got saved, I didn't even know what had happened. Kind of like that old song, Ron. I went there in doubt, but I left there with a shout. Because something got hold of me. <laughs> For Jesus said, whosoever shall call, or Paul wrote, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And now for these 56 years, I know on many occasions I have failed my Lord, but I know he's never failed me. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. For God cannot lie. And his word said, Jesus said this, I, that I would never perish. And his word says, there's nothing that will ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And my dear friend, his grace is greater than all your sin. You say, Brother Paul, you don't know what I've done. I say, I'm glad I don't. But I'm glad you don't know what I've done. At least not all of it. <laughs> One of Satan's greatest fears is for you as a Christian, listen to this, is for you to be strong and secure and confident in your faith. For when your fears meet your faith, they do not stand a chance. <clears throat> A little story and I'll close. It was on November the 9th, 1949. November the 9th, 1949. In case you want to know my birthday, you want to give me a birthday party. <laughs> November the 9th, 1949. I was born into the family of James and Melissa King. <clears throat> I didn't even know that I was born. I didn't say, ooh, I'm born. Can you imagine that, Marla? David turned around and said, hey, Mom, I'm born. <laughs> didn't do that. I didn't know I was even born. I didn't know for a year or two. And then I sort of began to figure it out a little. Somebody put my name on a birth certificate. They put an official seal on it. My parents were James and Melissa King. I am related to them by the blood. Amen. I could go anywhere in the world and still I would be related by the blood. I could do anything that I wanted to do. And by the blood, they could still prove that I was their son. 1967, I was born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, even though he was very religious and went to church, went to the temple and knew a lot about the Torah, he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Since that time, 1967 until now, I've done a lot of things. I've gone a lot of places. And I've done some things not so good. But still I'm born again. Amen. Related to God by the blood. Hallelujah. By the blood of his son Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. I am an heir to the kingdom of God. Amen. He is our father. And if you know his son Jesus Christ, your name is written in the will. And there's no eraser, no eraser. Just like when you play golf, Ron, they don't have an eraser on that pencil. Your name's written down, written down in glory. Now, I don't want to get too emotional, but I remember when Jason was saved back as a little boy. And how we as a family stayed together for so long. 
But then Satan got involved, took him everywhere, took him a lot of different places, did a lot of different things. But I have the assurance, Julia, that my son's in heaven. He's with his mama. And he's with our Lord and Savior. All because, as a little boy, as a little boy, now you can get saved at any age, right? You can get saved at any age, is that right? Am I correct in saying that? But I'm glad I have that faith. And my faith overcomes all the fears that I may have. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We are related to God by the blood. He is your father. If in fact, now listen to me. If in fact you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head with us, please? Father, we thank you for your word. Today, Lord, I try to give some sense of security to your people. The world is in turmoil. The political world is absolutely going crazy. And yet, Father, we know greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. You said it is better to trust in God than to have confidence in the president. So help us, Lord, to put our faith and trust in you alone, knowing that the king's heart is in the hand of God, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. Now, Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, then I ask that they might come to know you as their Savior. And, be, and rest assured, or if there's somebody here today who keeps asking themselves, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know. Well... Help them, Father, to give, let them be secure in their faith. To just ask you, just ask, Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. Pray that little simple prayer. Help them to know that they are your child and you've been searching for them. You've been longing and looking for them. They are precious. They are precious. Like our little children. Our, our little children are precious in our sight. We are precious in your sight. So I pray, Father, if there's anyone here that know you, that they will know you. Or if there's someone here today who feels insecure, that they'll just make sure of their relationship with you. And then if there's someone listening by way of YouTube, sitting on their couch or laying in the bed or sitting at the kitchen table, I pray, Father, that they might hear and uh, put their faith and trust in you go to a church somewhere close by, get baptized, and start serving you. May your will be done in each of our lives. Thank you for loving us. And we love you because you first loved us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Stand with us, please, and turn to what number, Brandon? 342, just as I am. 342, just as I am. Thank you very much.